Tonight we are going to talk about cessationism versus continuationism. Yeah. Americans have a gift for isms. Um, every social undercurrent and movement has an ism. Now, what is cessationism and what is continuationism? Cessationists believe that sign gifts, the sign gifts of the spirit, miracles, tongues, prophecies, ceased at the end of the apostolic era. Continuationists believe that all the gifts are in effect today, even raising the dead, instantaneous healing, signs and wonders, prophesying. Now, when you talk about new truth, is not new truth aside from the Bible. It is truth regarding your own experience. The Holy Spirit will guide you through your paths in life and will reveal something new and specific for your life. But not a part and not contradicting the Holy Scriptures. And that speaking in tongues is an evidence of spirit filling. So let's talk about this. I'm going to present a few arguments for continuationism, obviously. We are a Pentecostal church, a Romanian Pentecostal church, and we believed and experienced these truths for about a hundred years. Um, in uh, 2122, Pentecostalism came to Romania. In 23, uh, we just celebrated a hundred years of Romanian Pentecostalism in America. And let me say this. We have a very elaborate doctrine about the person and the power of the Holy Spirit based on the scripture and based on experience, which has to be according to the scripture. So first, I'm going to present the biblical argument. Now you have uh, the words of Peter on the day of Pentecost. They asked, brothers, what shall we do? Their hearts were pierced by the word of God, condemning them of rejecting Christ. And now they're capitulating in front of the gospel. Jesus being presented as the son of God. Jesus being presented as the Savior, crucified Savior, resurrected Savior. Nevertheless, they are accused of having crucified him and killing him. And they are condemned by the Spirit in their hearts and they ask, what shall we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized. He's talking about the baptism in water. Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, later on, Peter said, this promise, the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the gift of the Holy Spirit belongs to you, to your children, the next generation, 
and to all who are far off too. All whom the Lord our God will call to himself. Now, far off, it means 2,000 years later. The idea that the gifts of the Spirit and the Spirit, as he was poured on the day of Pentecost and worked, worked through signs and wonders and miracles in the first generation of Christians, in the apostolic era, has ceased. It's not biblical. This promise is for all who will be saved, including you and including me. So this is the biblical argument. It is black and white in the scripture. We've said this last week. For a principle to be a principle, it has to be applicable with everybody, anywhere, and everywhere. Otherwise, it's just a personal experience. And at any time, this is a principle. So the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not just a personal experience. It is, but it is a promise for all. It is applicable who, for every believer in history. The promise belongs to you, to your children, and to all. Even 20 centuries later. So this is the biblical argument. Secondly, the practical argument. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, talking about the practical argument, did they reach the ends of the earth in the first generation? No. They didn't even have a complete map of all the places in the world. The Americas had not yet been discovered. There were so many nations and peoples in the world that needed to be reached with the gospel. So from a practical standpoint, understanding that the power of the Holy Spirit with the fruit and with the gifts had been given for the practical purpose of achieving global evangelization had not been achieved in that generation. It is only now close to the end of it. Now that we have the complete map of the world, so from a practical standpoint, from a practical argument, the reason for the baptism, the reason for the gifts, the reason for the power could have not been nullified in the first generation, in the apostolic era. We still had a ways to go in going to the ends of the earth to evangelize, to spread the gospel. So it would have not been practical to end the gifts, to end 
the power of the Holy Spirit present in people's lives. Now I understand, and let me make it clear, we still have the apostolic work and purpose of spreading the gospel where it had not been present in the past. Nations who never heard about Jesus. This is an apostolic project. But the apostles, the 12 apostles, and I'm thinking the 11 plus Paul, he was God's elect for that position. We cannot have that ministry anymore, and the reason is to be an apostle of Christ, and I know a lot of people would give themselves titles nowadays, I'm apostle this and apostle that, God bless them, let them go to uh, in the jungles of the Amazon and just spread the gospel over there, let them be apostles, but the apostolic order of Christ is given to the apostles that had heard the gospel directly from Christ. It was those 11 for three and a half years, and it was Paul in the wilderness of Arabia. He had received the gospel of divine origin directly from Christ. You remember what he says in the book of Galatians? After 14 years, he went to Jerusalem. He confronted his gospel with the other apostles' gospel, and they found them to match perfectly without any difference, without any contradiction. Why? Because the source was similar. It was Christ directly giving them the gospel, the 11 and Paul. This is the apostolic order. That's why they wrote scriptures. Now we write commentaries, motivational books, interpretation books, but we don't write scriptures anymore. So I wanted to make clear what the apostolic order is. So nobody believes that we think we can be apostles outside of God giving somebody a phenomenal exception, but still it would not match the apostolic order of Paul and Peter and the rest of them. So from a practical standpoint, Gifts could have not ceased with the first generation of Christians. Acts 8, 14 to 17, now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen on any of them, even though they believed. Now, this is a death blow to the false doctrine that you are baptized with the Holy Spirit when you believe. It's not true. It is a heresy, considering this text. They had not experienced the Holy Spirit. They needed to receive it, but they believed. They were converted. They were born again. So they sent Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So what does it mean? Why were they baptized? When you are baptized, what do you witness to? Your new birth. We do not baptize in water people that are not born again, that had not been converted, that had not believed. 
And yet they believed, they were born again, they were saved, they were baptized in water, and yet they did not receive the gift, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So they bit their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. It is one of the methods by which the Holy Spirit is baptizing people through the hands of ministers. Now remember when they went to the house of Cornelius. It was the first time somebody from the Gentiles, from the world, would be converted to Christ and would receive Christ as Savior. Peter was sent to the house of Cornelius by God through a revelation. So he goes into the house of Cornelius. Now, if they had a vote in the church in Jerusalem, how many of them do you think they would have approved for Cornelius and his house to be baptized in water and accepted as members of the church? None, because at that time, Jews believed that you could not be Christians without being Jews also. They didn't accept the Gentiles. So, Peter had to explain himself, because after Cornelius and his house were baptized with the Holy Spirit, while listening to the word, once the word was believed, and they were converted, and supernaturally born again, by the word, it is a reversed order. And Peter said, can anyone withhold the water to baptize these people? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Now this is the practical argument. Christians, new converts all over the place, the first priority, once they believe, once they are born again, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. This is the practical argument. We didn't yet reach the end of the world. And every time in the Bible, a new convert comes to Christ, the main priority is for him to experience the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts chapter 18, there's a very interesting story. We have a phenomenal preacher. Now I've been asked many times, we see a lot of great preachers and they did not experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And in the Romanian language, I've already explained this to the church, but I'm gonna explain it to you too. The Holy Spirit works in three ways. First, through divine inspiration. In the Old Testament, he would inspire prophets to talk about things that they didn't even understand. Do you remember, I mean, Peter and Pentecost is citing David, the prophet. And he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit until I'm going to bring down all your enemies. So now he has God speaking to God. So in the Old Testament, they would introduce the concept of Trinity, which was considered a heresy. They only had one God, right? And we have one God in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So David the prophet, and other prophets introduce communication between God and God. Remember Genesis, the creation, where it is used the plural, let us make. But that was not because they understood the concept. It was through divine inspiration. Secondly, the second method that the Holy Spirit uses is illumination. 
It brings light into the heads of people, to the brains of people, into the hearts of people, to understand the gospel. Now, every person that listens to the message of the gospel for the first time is not baptized with the Holy Spirit. So, how do they understand the word? The Holy Spirit working, illuminating their minds and their souls and their hearts to understand the gospel. Now, a lot of you uh, came from the world. Maybe you listened to a few sermons. Somebody preached the gospel to you and you didn't understand anything until one day you come to church and all of a sudden you understand everything. You understand what the preacher says. What happened? Have you become any smarter? Was the sermon better? No. The Holy Spirit turned the light on in your heart and in your head. And you understood. So it is the method of illumination. And when a person is enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they can understand the gospel and they can preach the gospel very well, as Apollos would do. The Bible says that he was very knowledgeable. He only knew the baptism of John, that's what the Bible says. But he was a very good preacher and he proved Christ to be the Messiah. And he confronted the Jews. So look at this. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they heard his wonderful preaching. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Now they approached him boldly, but tactfully. They knew what part of the gospel he was missing. They knew how to teach him the rest of the truth. And the great Apollos humbled himself and allowed two lowly ten makers to teach him. Now what was the part of the gospel that he was missing? He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and was fervent in spirit. That is energetic. He spoke and taught accurately about Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. That means Apollos didn't know about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He didn't know about the gifts of the Spirit. Now, in Acts 19, Apostle Paul meets the disciples of John the Baptist in Ephesus, and he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? Now, this is another argument that you don't necessarily receive the gift of the Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you believe. Now, in the day of Pentecost, they believe, and immediately they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. These people believed, but they did not receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is always visible. It has a visual and you can hear. There is something audible about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You've seen them. God had pulled what you have seen and what you have heard. So it's not just secret, not just somewhere mysteriously happen happening in your heart as it is with a new birth. When you become born again, the baptism of the Spirit, it has a visual and it has an audible. So, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So, what happened? 
And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Everywhere in the scripture where you hear about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it is directly stated or very closely implied that there is the gift of speaking in tongues or as it was in the beginning with us. When, Paul, when Peter uh, gave account of what happened in the house of Cornelius, said they were baptized as we were in the beginning. So this is the practical argument. Thirdly, the interpretational argument, or some misinterpretations in the Bible. Now you've heard about 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be rest restrained. Where there is knowledge, it will be dismissed. Because the greatest of all is love. So it is talking about some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that will cease. Now, what happened is uh, the cessationist crowd is seizing on this argument immediately and they say, see? But when would that happen? For 1 Corinthians 13, 10. But when the perfect comes, the partial passes away. So they say, the word of God in 66 books, once it was gathered, compiled, put together, and recognized as the divine, inerrant word of God, of God, this is perfection, and when perfection came, there was no need for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, I'm not going to go into the fact that when the Bible was completed, it had not been translated for hundreds of years in the language of the people. So it still had to be preached by evangelists that would go from nation to nation and tell them about it, but they didn't have the Word of God at their disposal. They could not read the Word of God. Not only that, but the apostate church had restricted the access of the masses from the Word of God. So they would control them and they would tell them whatever they wanted from their pulpits. But let's talk about what is that perfection that comes. Look at what the Bible says in Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. I'm not yet perfect, says Paul. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now remember, not only he did not reach perfection, he wrote scriptures. He wrote most of the scriptures, the apostolic epistles in the New Testament, and yet he did not reach perfection, not yet. He's striving for it, but this talks about his personal life, 
Not about something outside of him, but something that happens inside of him. Perfection is not outside of you and you're looking at it. Perfection is inside of it, of you and you achieve it, striving, pressing on and taking hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. It is a matter of relationship between Christ and me. That is achieving perfection. Not the fact that the Bible had been complete. Now, let's look at 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are now children of God, and what we will be has not yet been revealed. Now, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. What will cease? Prophecies. Great. Cessationists are applauding. Tongues. Wonderful. Cessationists are getting rowdy. But remember, knowledge. What about knowledge? When will knowledge cease to be a gift? When perfection comes. So my question is, do we have total knowledge? Because the Bible says, we do not know yet. Because it had not been revealed what and how we will be. We know partially. But we know that when Christ appears, only when Christ appears, we will be like him. Now he is the perfection of God for us. Remember what Paul said in, the, in Hebrews. He is our perfection. And only when he comes, we will be like him. Perfect like him in every way. For we will see him as he is. My friends, it is dishonest to exclude the speaking in tongues and the prophecy, but say, oh, uh, what other gifts do we have? Knowledge? Oh, we'll, we'll take that. A discernment? We'll take that. Wisdom? We'll take it. Tongues? We don't need it. Prophecies? We don't need it. Who do you think you are to make some such distinction? Where did you get that the package can be separated in categories? Now I understand that theology does that. We have gifts of power, gifts of knowledge, gifts of revelation. I understand that. But not where it counts to Paul. He's presenting it as a total package. So, this is the interpretational argument. Now, the all-inclusive argument Because for a while, we've been made to believe that only apostles or pastors or prophets have the access to the gifts of the Spirit. But look at what Jesus says in Mark 16, 17. And these signs will accompany those who believe. Now. Before we get all excited and think that we can perform miracles, 
It is not because of your courage. It is not because you want to do that. It is only when God wills it. See, remember when Jesus said to the Pharisees and the scribes when he healed the lame guy brought down through the ceiling because he said forgiven are your sins so they said who's he to forgive sins now I understand he can heal the sick but what about forgiving sins so he asked the question what is harder to say or what is easier to say Forgiven are your sins, or rise, take your bed, and walk. Now let me tell you, for Jesus, it was harder to say forgiven are your sins, because he had to pay for it with his life. It was nothing for Christ to say, walk. She was God. His word was powerful. It would make things happen instantaneously. But for me, it is easier to say, forgiven are your sins. Because my mouth would not be in pain when I say that. It would not hurt my tongue to say it. I mean, Priests say it every day, all over the place. And they're not struck by lightning. Even though they don't have the authority to forgive sins. But bring them a lame person, a blind person, a terminal, terminally sick person, and tell them, heal them. Make this guy walk. If he says, walk, and he doesn't walk, What is it? He'll say, you're obnoxious. What do you think you are saying this? And it doesn't happen. So what I'm saying is, if you believe things like this can happen, but only if you are called by God and gifted by God, in that respect. If God didn't send you to heal the sick, the lame and the blind, don't go in your own power and courage. It's not going to happen. It has to be mandated by God. But as a general rule, the availability of gifts is universal. God can choose anybody to gift him with such a gift. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, and so on and so forth. So this is talking about availability, which is universal. This is the all-inclusive argument. When you are baptized with the Holy Spirit, you have access to the gifts of the Holy Spirit spirit and there are many of them and I believe there's plenty for all of us but remember in 1st Corinthians chapter 12 these gifts are imparted by the spirit to whom he pleases so I don't just go and say I like this or I like that it is through the impartation of the spirit and the will of God that we receive the gift. But they are available to the church and available to all who believe. So this is the all-inclusive argument. In uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 to 11, for the one 
is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirit. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So just make a note of that, underline it, and understand it. For First Corinthians 12, 28, and in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and those with gifts of healing, helping, administration, and various tongues. Now, here we see some extra gifting for administrative work, and we understand by this that nothing that we do comes from us. It all comes from God when we are involved in his work. The different tongues argument. First Corinthians 13, verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels. Understanding, because some people would say, well, yeah, but when... Uh, they got baptized with the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. They spoke in known language. And to these I say, good. Ask for the baptism, and I wish you speak in Chinese, Indian, whatever language, but speak in a tongue. And if you do not accept the tongues of angels, fine. But at least speak in a tongue that you don't know. So the Holy Spirit will prove the baptism in your life. I say again, speak in Chinese. Speak in Italian. Speak in Romanian. But speak in tongues. If you do not accept the angelic tongues, but that's where they are. So the different tongues argument. First Corinthians 14, 2. Now in First Corinthians chapter 12, we find out about the gifts of the Spirit. In First Corinthians 13, we find out about the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we find out about the order of the Spirit. For he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. So, on the day of Pentecost, they had tongues speaking to men, known tongues. There are tongues which are used and you do not speak to men. They don't have to understand you. Therefore, your, your own edification. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries in the spirit. So that tongue does not have to be human. It can be angelic. It is a way of the spirit communicating the things of God and edifying one that's why the Bible says, don't speak in unknown tongues without interpretation in public because people don't understand. Unless somebody has the gift of interpretation of tongues, translation of tongues. But when you're praying by yourself, at the congregational prayer, speak in tongues all you want. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than every one of you. It is edifying. It is necessary. 
it is desirable. So we see here the different tongues argument. Six, the witness argument. The reason the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and baptizes us in a visible and audible way, it is because the Spirit is a witness and He witnesses in our life the new birth and the new life and the new mandate. Look at what it says in 1 John chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. So we need the witness of the Spirit on earth, not only in heaven. The Spirit of God witnesses in heaven and on earth, both, is the common denominator when it comes to witnessing. What does he witness? Romans chapter 8. You read the whole chapter, I don't have the time to do that. The witness of the new birth. You heard Brother Florin reading earlier about the Spirit witnesses our adoption that we can call God, Abba, Father. So witnesses the new birth. Witnesses or the witness of the transformed life, reading Romans 8 where it says those that, are, that belong to God, that are children of God, walk guided by the Spirit and are looking for the things of the Spirit. So the Spirit witnesses a transformed life. And then the witness of the eternal life. Those who have the Spirit in them, they will be resurrected. So it all depends on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the witness of the new birth, the witness of the transformed life, the witness of the eternal life. What is the main gift that separates us from all other beings is com verbal communication. So you remember when God was alone, he was speaking and the word created everything. Now when the spirit comes in somebody's life, witnesses by the same method speaking taking control of one's body. You remember in James, it says if you can control the tongue, you control the whole body. So the Spirit comes into your life to control the whole body. How does he prove that? Controlling the tongue. Now be aware of the fact. And I already told you about the method of inspiration the method of illumination, the third method in which the Spirit works in somebody's life is through inhabitation. When the Spirit comes into your body and you become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then, lastly, the personal argument. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You know what? I have that testimony in my heart. You can call me names. And you know that as a church and as believers, we are not hyper-charismatics. 
We don't believe in all this nonsense going in charismatic churches. They are way beyond the manifestations, the true manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But I have that personal experience. And nobody can, make, can convince me that I didn't get the experience of the Holy Spirit, of the baptism, of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues in my life. I am as sure of it as I was 42 years ago. This is the personal argument. And a final warning. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. He is guilty of eternal sin. Mark 3.29, the words of Christ. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. But blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. It comes from the original blasphemio, to speak reproachfully, rail at, revile, calumniate. It is not acceptable. As I've said many times in this church, don't be one of those that speak of what they don't know about. If you don't know, just keep your mouth shut. But when the, and this is the context in which Jesus talked about that, the blasphemy. But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, does this man drive out demons. So all those miracles, all those supernatural and wondrous things that Jesus performed, they had to explain them away. And the only way they could explain them away was by saying it's by the power of the devil. And that was blasphemous. And that's when Jesus said, everything will be tolerated and forgiven through repentance. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, when you see the work of the Holy Spirit, when you see the power of the Holy Spirit, when you see the manifestations of the Holy Spirit and you contradict it and you speak reproachfully and you rail it and you insult it and you calumny that it is blasphemy don't don't do it now the Romanian Pentecostal Churches Union and the Lim Romanian Pentecostal Church. We believe in the supernatural signs, revelatory and confirmatory of speaking and of serving. As a lift, list of gifts of the Spirit, we believe they are actual, they are present. And the Holy Spirit works the same as 2,000 years ago. Praise the Lord. And also, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. This is the belief of our church, the doctrine of our church, and the doctrine of our union. And I pray that God would help us to hold on to it. Young people, be careful. I know you are exposed to a lot of cessationists. They're finding bad examples, obviously. Every now and then you have a false prophet. You have a false manifestation. Oh, by all means, we have false money in this world, but nobody says there is not true money, right? And uh, nobody falsifies anything that does not have value. 
I mean, I, this is colorful, this is a nice, nice page. Uh -huh. I think it looks better than a dollar bill. But nobody would falsify this because it's worth a few cents. But they take money and they falsify it because it has value. And this is why we have some aberrations. But nobody should look at those aberrations and nullify and contradict the authentic work of the Holy Spirit now in the present exactly as it happened 2,000 years ago because that promise is for all of us. So in two weeks time or less come to Storuins. Come let's pray. And I say, you know what? You don't have to do anything special. But if you sincerely pray, and if you act in faith and ask, what shall I do? And maybe you are baptized in water. Great. You were converted. Wonderful. You believed. Wonderful. Maybe you're striving to live a more perfect life. That's wonderful. But I challenge you, come and ask for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. You've got nothing to lose. The Bible says that if a son asks the father for bread, not going to give him a rock. Ask for an egg and give him a snake. Ask for the Holy Spirit and trust the Lord to prove to you that the promise is for all of us. The promise is for you. Let's stand and let's pray that even tonight God will bring the light of the Holy Spirit in, your, in our minds, in our hearts to believe this. Because it is true. Because it is biblical. Because it is practical. Because it is proven. Because it happens all the time in our midst. And because it cannot be honestly contradicted. And let's ask that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon our lives even tonight. Let's pray together.